Today's passage from Luke chapter 9 is uh, one that is heavily steeped into Judaism. It has many references in Hebrew scripture, and I would have you hear it as those who heard it in the first century. And so I'm going to give you a, a bit of reference as we go through the text, would ask you to hear Luke 9 and 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Christ become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. Several passages have strong reference, but for me this is the strongest reference to the tie into Hebrew Scripture. As the time approached, uh, alternately you could hear that as, as the day approached. In other words, it was God's timing. This is Jesus following the Father. And that has to be understood very clearly. And if you read that text out of context, you would think this is something that's happened after the cross and the resurrection because it talks about what? As the time approached for Jesus to be lifted up. We're talking ascension. What, is there no cross in Luke's gospel? No, Luke takes a longer version when he talks about Jesus on the cross. He starts from this point, and from here on there's a travel log, and every time Jesus moves or does anything, it's understood that he's on his way to Jerusalem. And in the travel log, you understand how he's drawing closer and closer and closer, and the music becomes more intense, and you have this understanding that this great thing is happening from this point on into the ascension It's what Luke considers to be the work of Jesus for you and I for our salvation. All of it. But simultaneously, it's also a call for us to follow. As the Father sets the agenda for the Lord Jesus, Jesus is saying if you are to be my disciple, you need to follow the agenda I set for you. And what he does here is he gives us what the agenda is. Before we go to that, let's look at this idea of what is it for Jesus to ascend to heaven. Twice in Hebrew Scripture, we're told of of people who are taken up to heaven. One, Elijah, by the fiery chariot. And that imagery is is very clear. And Jesus in this text is is quite commonly compared to Elijah. And we're going to see that in a minute. Unless you fall asleep. No promises. (laughs) But the figure I want you to remember is Enoch from Genesis. The text says, and Enoch walked with God. And God took him. God raptured him. God just snatched him up. A little girl in Sunday school was explaining it this way when the school teacher, Sunday school teacher, was reading that text. And she said, children, what does this mean? And, and uh, the little girl said, well, uh, Enoch walked with God. Every day they'd get up and they'd go out for a walk. And they'd walk and they'd walk and they'd walk. And the day came that God said, Enoch, you're closer to my house than yours. Why don't you just come home and stay with me? Who am I to argue? (laughs) And so we have here this idea that from the very beginning we understand the destination is not Jerusalem. The destination is God's kingdom. But you go through Jerusalem to get there. Uh, You know, in in, in Psalm 23 we're told that we uh, are in the valley of the shadow of death. We're not in the valley of death. 
it's a shadow. Well, here you're going right through the valley. For us, it's a shadow. For Jesus, it is the valley of death. And he's going. And he knows it from the start, and it's prepared, it's planned, it's part of the Father's will, and it's the agenda for the Father to the Son. And then the Son sets our agenda. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, resolutely. If you look back at Ezekiel 21, 2 and 3, you'll see that set his face is a Hebrew phrase for one who is being commissioned for judgment. Jesus is being commissioned here. And he set his face. It's like flint. He sets his face to Jerusalem. There's going to be judgment coming. And he's focused. There's a commissioning along with the plan of God. God the Father giving the agenda to the Son and the Son giving the agenda to us. There's a commissioning that goes along with that. And Jesus is commissioned to set his face for judgment. You and I are commissioned, and we see what the text says. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. In the old days, they called Samaria the northern kingdom. Every now and then you'll hear me talk about my last congregation, and I'll make reference to having served time in the northern kingdom. Because, anyway, never mind. If you don't get the joke with that explanation, it's not funny anyway. So, Jesus is above what was the northern kingdom. And he must pass through. And Jews would always push through Samaria. And they were pushy as they pushed through. And as Samaria, as the, as the northern kingdom, fell further and further from the worship of the true God and became Samaria, there was antagonism that arose between the two. And you see that in, in John 4, the woman at the well. You know, uh, Jesus asked for a drink of woman, a water, and... and uh, you know, the woman says, you know, you would you ask me, a, a woman of Samaria, for a drink? And then there's a comment that John gives so that you understand why she says it that way. She says, for Jews don't have anything to do with Samaritans. You know what the literal translation is there? I love this. It has nothing to do with the sermon, so don't count this as my time. This is a joke. <laughs> Jews won't eat off the same dishes that Samaritans eat off of. That's what it really says there in that text. Why? Because Jews thought Samaritans were half-breed, idolatrous fools. And so how do you think the Samaritans respond? They get ticked at Jesus, not for Jesus' sake, they get ticked at Jesus because of where Jesus is going. He's headed towards Jerusalem. And they think of all those other Jews who've headed for Jerusalem and how arrogant and uppity, uppity they were. And there is that recording of the time the Samaritan village arose and actually fought the Jews coming through. And all that is behind us, which is to say, if you do plan on following Jesus understand that those who see you may attack you not for you but for who you follow or where you're going and the first cost of being a disciple of Jesus is sometimes there's a cross to bear just having the name Jesus on your life not every Sunday but many Sundays in the time of the pastoral prayer, you'll hear me pray for those persecuted for the name of Jesus. That's the group I'm praying for. I'm praying for those people that for the name of Jesus, they could be kicked out of their family, 
for the name of Jesus had battery acid thrown on them, for the name of Jesus assaulted, fired, prevented from work, prevented from education, and even killed. That happens more frequently today than at any point in history. More Christians killed. And it's increasing at an increasing rate. And before you decide, I'm going to follow Jesus, you need to understand it's not a walk in the park. And the first thing you need to understand is sometimes people aren't attacking you. Early as a a pastor, I had to realize that sometimes people got mad at me, but they were really mad at the boss. And so I'd say things like, well, argue with him. He can handle it. I don't. But they still choose to follow. And so Jesus continues. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Now, that's pretty clearly a reference uh, to what happens to Elijah in 2 Kings 1. Uh, 2 Kings 1, twice Elijah calls down fire and it consumes a captain and 50 men sent to retrieve him. It happens once, all 51 killed. It happens twice, all 51 killed. That third guy shows up and says, please, (laughs) respect our life. I'm like that third guy. But anyway, the disciples, James and John, think, well, Jesus is just as good as Elijah, maybe even better. Let's pull in Elijah. But you know something? Our boss doesn't like the idea of revenge. But Jesus turned and rebuked them. You don't use force. You don't use violence. Jesus came the first time to save. Now there will be judgment. And as we saw last week in the text, that sometimes people and even demons confuse the time. They, the demons last week, asking to go into pigs, ha- had the right person, but the wrong time. Jesus wasn't there to judge. He still is not. What does that say to us today? We're not allowed to seek revenge. We're not allowed to use force. We're not allowed to... Uh, do the things that Earl instinctively would do living a life in Christ. Now, some of the manuscripts, not the oldest, but many of the ancient manuscripts add in a phrase that whether or not it was original certainly is appropriate. They have Jesus saying, you don't know what spirit you're of. And that pretty much accurately Gives you the understanding. You know, when you're following Jesus, all of a sudden you can feel mighty righteous and end up following the wrong spirit. I want the one known as holy. But the Holy Spirit doesn't do vengeance. Then Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. That's the saddest passage in the text. Yeah, you can say no to Jesus, but don't expect him to hang around. He goes elsewhere. I was reading Mr. Wesley this week, imagine that. He said part of the purpose of Methodist preachers is just to stir up a desire for God. Uh, Not necessarily to convert But just to, as it were, now this is my phrase, and give you a holy itch for God. And and that seed has been planted, but Jesus is not doing much more than that. He goes on elsewhere. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go.
Jesus replied, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. If you do follow Jesus, don't expect financial security. I have known dozens of preachers that were called of God and chose to follow but demanded financial security. But guess what? It's not just preachers. It's entire congregations. We think that Jesus is preaching prosperity gospel. No, that's on TV. Jesus is preaching there's no financial guarantee. You, you, you can be like a fox. A friend of mine was telling me about a dream he had. It was based out of Matthew 25, the, the judgment between uh, the sheep and the goats. You know, the sheep go one way, the goats go the other way. And they both asked the question, when did we see you sick, naked, in prison, hungry? And he gives that line, as you have done to the least of these, my brothers, so you've done to me. But in the dream, my friend decides to de- not to decide. He decides to sit on the fence between the sheep and the goats because he's got friends on both sides. In the dream, the devil or somebody comes to him and says, come on, go with me. And my friend says, but I haven't chosen sides. And the devil or whoever the figure is says, but I own the fence. The the interpretation I give it is to not decide is to decide no. You know, you either clearly decide yes or no. But if you do decide yes, understand that in this life, there's trouble. And that also includes the possibility of financial insecurity. This guy wants to follow, but he wants to follow safe. Y'all remember C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia? Where is it little Lucy finds out that the Christ figure is Aslan the lion. She asks, is it safe? And the response, of course it's not safe. He's a lion, <laughs> but he's good. He said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, first, Lord, let me go bury my father. Now, you understand there's a Jewish obligation to honor your father and mother, Exodus 20. And part of that is to take care of them in their death. But scholars don't believe that this guy's father is dead in the moment because he wouldn't be with Jesus. They believe that he's old. They believe that the death is going to be in the next year or two. And basically he's saying, give me some time off. For 20-something years, my only request to the bishop and cabinet in this annual conference was that they appoint me to Memphis. Because in that area, my father was very old, and in that area I could spend time with him. And so they appointed me first to Dyersburg, and that wasn't far enough, and so then they appointed me to Paducah. And I started to get angry. And I heard the text one more time in my ears, let the dead bury the dead. I want to be alive, and so my focus has to be on the living. Now there's a pattern here. One person says, I want to follow. And then Jesus calls and says, follow me. And then the next person goes back to the first. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Now, that's pretty much a quotation from Elisha, 1 Kings 19. Elijah calls his servant Elisha. He takes his mantle, his overcoat off, and he throws it across. Elisha, 
And that's the calling. And Elisha says, first, let me go home and and say goodbye. He's plowing at the time. That's where this idea of no man who puts his hand to the plow and turns back. But he's plowing at the time. And Elisha's way of saying goodbye is to slaughter the ox he's plowing with and break up the plow and start a fire with the wood of the plow and roast the ox. Talking about burning your bridges. You'll never plow with that equipment again. But Jesus said, you don't even have time to do an Elisha. You don't have time for goodbye because goodbye looks towards the end. No man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back. And for us, that would be our old way, our old life, anything in the past. Because God is in the future and God is in the now. Yes, God is in the past, but our calling is present future. Sometimes I ask people, do you believe that tomorrow is going to be better than today? I asked a variation of that to Bible study Wednesday. I said, how many of y'all think that uh, life was more simpler as a child? You can just guess what the response was. A variation. Who believes the future is better? Tomorrow is going to be better than today. To follow Jesus, you have to believe that. You come to believe Because tomorrow is kingdom, is God, who wipes away every tear, no more pain, no more death. The former things have passed away, Revelation chapter 21. Jesus is commissioned by the Father. Jesus commissions those who would follow and to say that you don't decide is to decide no. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.